Hello everyone, my name is Alessandra and I am the Project and Communication Officer at EXA, European Composer and Songwriter Alliance. EXA is a professional alliance formed by over 60 associations of composers and songwriters from all over Europe. To mark Mental Health Awareness Week, I will be here today with a guest to talk about mental health in the music industry and especially the struggles that music creators often face and how they can hopefully overcome them. So joining us is one of EXA delegates, John Groves from Composers Club in Germany. John is a composer and psychoacoustic specialist. He founded Sonic Tonic, an app which combines different auditory techniques to produce immersive soundscapes. John, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Okay, my pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me. Uh, psychoacoustics always sounds really cool and sounds like something with psycho is going to be got. But basically what that is, is talking about sound and music from the perspective of the listener. And we would call it sort of the auditory view of it. And as I have been, uh, a, a, let's say, a sort of like a commissioned writer my whole life, it gradually got away from just writing music, but just then to look at sounds, sounds for navigation, ambient sounds, and to find out what this was actually doing to our, our psyche. So that interested me very much. And I thought, well, getting older to say it's not a bug, it's a feature. And to really get my uh, experience uh, a value, I decided to learn about it. So I went on a kind of a crash course <laughs> over a few years, of course. But these days, you can do this uh, on Google, on YouTube. You can learn an awful lot of stuff. So I have a very deep knowledge, but not very wide, you know, on this specific thing of how sound and audio affects us. And this fits very well in my work life as well, because I distance myself from the uh, making music and recordings, which I regret, but I still uh, make music as a, as a hobby, and end up working with projects such as this and it's very very interesting and that brought me uh, in the end to healthcare and I'm sure we're going to talk about that later on because that is the theme but that is basically where I'm at today where did I come from you didn't ask but I'll answer anyway I'm a jingle writer I started off writing very short 10 second long uh, jingles which over the years became shorter and shorter uh, as the time became more uh, short on TV, and they ended up being sound logos, which are as short as 880 milliseconds. And when I tell people that I get paid for creating 880, second, uh, 880 second milliseconds of sound, they think that's absolutely crazy. But when you measure afterwards the amount of recall you can get and the amount of information you can pack into 880 milliseconds. It really is amazing. Well, thank you, John. Um, you have had a lot of experience in the music industry and you mentioned in healthcare now. Uh, the music industry reportedly has an above average mental health issue than most other industries. What do you think are the primary causes of this? Yeah, well, we're sensitive souls. I mean, basically, <laughs> that is the thing. I mean, even the most uh, radical heavy metal uh, rock, mu rock music musician has a, a kind of a soul <laughs> and thinks a lot. I can't really talk for musicians and artists in general, but I believe I can talk a little bit for composers because what the composers have generally going for them is creativity. We have to make stuff and we make something out of nothing or we make something out of other things that we observe. So we have to be observant to look at the world around us and to listen to the world around us and to think. And I think it's the combination of this observational uh, status that we're in or modus and, and thinking that makes us create, of course, the musical talent, but I believe that's somewhere else in, in the brain, but to become a composer, you learn how to put things together and that makes you very creative. So you have to think a lot. And it is unfortunately this thinking which can be very damaging 
in mental health because what happens is you start to become aware of your changing environment and you become very aware of the potential dangers and even though they're only potential and they most probably will never happen uh, when you are creative you have an active uh, and very lively imagination you start imagining all sorts of things and you imagine these things one after the other you try to go through every scenario and when you've got to the end you go back again and this is damaging our worst enemy uh, are our own thoughts and i believe that is the reason why artists and composers suffer more definitely uh, so being creative souls having a creative soul and also those all those accompanying um, lifestyles of like most artists and composers and songwriters so all those external factors like financial insecurity like the pressure the competition the loneliness um so adding to this unique set of circumstances now we are experiencing a, an unprecedented time like the covid 19 crisis what are your thoughts on mental health for music creators in 2020 and in this particular time of covid 19 crisis yeah well i think basically help is needed as you said, I mean, it's a hard enough life as it is. You know, the average musician or let, let's say composer in this case, I have to talk about that because I'm not a, a musician and I know that there are musicians that are employed with orchestras and things and they'll be saying, well, that doesn't fit with me. But there's very few really employed composers. They're usually freelancers. And as you said, they have this problem of not having security in their lives, which is for some people totally unimaginable. Not to know where the next paycheck is coming from needs a certain kind of mentality. And so there is a constant sort of nagging fear, an existential fear in a lot of composers. And no matter how successful they are, and no much how money they have on the, the bank, uh, in the bank, it is uh, always nagging. And now that things have happened like a lockdown and uh, the jobs that you had are, are taken away, there is real fear. And speaking again as a composer, the difference here is that it is carried forward. The jobs that have now been canceled, we'll feel them firstly next year or the year afterwards. So they are long-term problems that need addressing but your question was what can we do about the mental health i mean it could be perhaps fixing the problem because that is what is going to happen if nothing is done but the immediate help must be to help people with the way that they are feeling and i believe from what from what i see that although there's a lot of initiative going on that most composers slash artists are feeling very much alone at the moment with their worry so they need if not direct help they need advice that they need to be sought out they are probably not going to come of their own accord and it's no good for the government or anyone saying oh we've got this this thing you know i think the threshold to act with mental health is very very high you have to be really really bad before you reach out because you're not going to want to talk about it. And there's so many people suffering. I know in my job, uh, with, we'll talk later about my, my healthcare things, but when I start talking to, to, to people, um, unfortunately, I can see their smiles disappearing a little bit when they say, I know exactly what you mean. You know, I feel that way too. And people uh, have pains in their souls. And we could go into the philosophical side of the fast paced life or even religion even the lack of religion and the the atheists on the on the march and the lack of belief and not having any foundation uh, what it comes down to at the end is a loneliness and an emptiness and a loss of purpose and that's where we have to start because uh, it's much more widespread than anyone can think. Even the people that come and tell you that, it's more widespread than that. Certainly. Um, actually, like you said, choosing in the first place to, to be a musician, to be a composer, a creator, to work in this business is already, is already difficult. Um, and actually, um, just 
the struggle involved it's it's also this the struggle involved that ensures only like the most determined people can make can make a living of it um some examples of what artists and music professional can experience are uh, insomnia, anxiety, panic attacks, loneliness, as you said, sometimes substance abuse, um, performance anxiety, uh, in general, mental health. You were saying people need advice. And as a creator, is there anything um, that you can recommend? What are some tips, advice that you could give to overcome mental health issues in general? Well, um... I mean, advice, I don't feel qualified to give advice and I would not like to be responsible for anybody taking my advice, although I wouldn't have any radical advice. And some advice would not be taken anyway. If I say stay away from the drugs, uh, don't drink, <laughs> that's going to be ridiculous because sometimes that is the only consolation that people can have to get home and smoke a joint and chill out or to go and really get get pissed out of their minds so they're you know to numbing their feelings i understand that but there are other ways and i have had experience with all of that and i don't want to go into it but you can imagine that i'm not it didn't arrive yesterday and i've been a professional musician all my life and i've been a touring musician so i've experienced a lot of a lot of these things and what i know is there must at some point come the will and if you don't have the will, <laughs> you know, you, you can give up. But it's the people like that that will need, will need the help from outside. You're going to need some external uh, uh, influence coming in, an intervention which is going to help you. And these people have to be identified. So it's about friends of, of these people saying when they're, out, they're acting strange. You know, last year, there was a, a really incredible increase in suicide. And this was without COVID. And this was something that impressed me and disturbed me, uh, seeing the amount of people in my situation, so middle-aged old men, um, at a time in, in their life where problems uh, are not as easy to cope with when you're when you're young and I, I discovered actually from a BBC documentary that if you live in the north of England I think it was the northeast and you are between like 45 and and 60 that your main risk of dying is not from uh, cancer or a traffic accident it is from suicide so that means that the biggest danger is yourself it's your it's your thoughts and what I learned as well is that the causes are always the same, or always very, very similar. And that's the obvious things that we have, as we were talking about insecurities that come because of the, the job, uh, problems you, you will have in your job, not feeling secure there, or having no job, being unemployed, financial ones, loved ones, being left, loneliness. These are all things that if you don't know these problems, they sound like the lyrics of one of the songs we would write. <laughs> but uh, in my circle of acquaintances, I mean, believe it or not, four people killed themselves in 2019. And that is absolutely shocking. And, you know, you know COVID-19 has made the world sit back and re-examine themselves. It has done that what a young lady from Stockholm didn't manage is to get everybody, and I mean everybody really, to take time to reflect on their lives. And, you know, I, I know so many people now that are looking at trees and, and stuff like that and finding pleasure in, the, in, in nature and being grateful for what they have. Now, all these things can sound a little bit esoteric or, or new age, but they are happening to the majority of people today. So, you know, if anything good is coming out of this, it is that. Um, but, but back to these, these people with, the, with the, the, the mental health and what advice can I give them is to try to control your thoughts because that is where it's based. I don't want to get into any lecture on my newly found knowledge about the chemical uh, effects that thoughts can have on, on you, but it's obvious 
that there is an effect. If I were to such suddenly come very close to the camera, which I'm not going to do, and scream very loud, I would shock you. Um, you would have a, a response there, which means something would trigger somewhere. Uh, chemicals would be re released through an electrical charge somewhere in your, in your brain, and a reaction, a physical reaction could happen. Your heart would start beating. You would be prepared for fight or, or flight. And then I would tell you, ah, oh, you know, just thoughts. No, these thoughts really do stuff to you. And it's learning to know how to control these, these thoughts. And there are ways to, to do it. Now there's meditation. Big thing these days. Meditation has come into the mainstream, which is an incredibly good thing. But there's people like me that can't meditate. You know, I've tried. I don't like it. It's a, it seems a waste of time. I, I'm too busy to, to meditate. There's yoga. I can't even sit in the lotus position. I can't cross my legs. So, so forget that. Uh, but there, there is, is other stuff. But with other stuff, do you mean maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you do and your, your app, actually? Ah, I'm glad you asked that. This will become like an infomercial for Sonic Tonic. <laughs> but Sonic Tonic is the name of it. Now, as a musician um, and somebody who has experienced depression and anxiety and, and basically everything else you can put on the, on the list. And, you know, I don't want to be like some born again Christian that's discovered uh, God. I sort of discovered myself and I discovered it through music but through sound in general. And if you think that what I do for a living or that what I did when I was actually making music and not just talking about it, um, I realized that sitting down at the piano every day and playing was incredible. It's an incredible release. You can feel the worries just pouring off of you and you can feel yourself uh, relaxing. So that for me is very, very therapeutical. But there are times when the external forces are stronger and it doesn't work anymore. In fact, it's so damaging that you don't want to play anymore. Um, I discovered something then called autogenic training. Now, autogenic training is basically part of autosuggestion. Uh, and now autosuggestion, if anybody's watching this and they think, oh, there he goes, uh, getting on what he's dis di discovered as an esoteric thing, it is something that really works. I can demonstrate it if you see negative auto-suggestion about people saying, oh, this isn't going to work. I can't do that. I can't manage it. If I give you a job to write something for me uh, and I say I need it by six o'clock, you may suffer like hell uh, if, if you don't believe in yourself. And if you're having the negative thoughts I talked about before, oh, my English isn't good enough, or oh, I don't know the words, I don't know the subject. All these kind of thoughts can and probably will influence the output you give and will influence the outcome of what you're doing. One very good thing I like to tell people is to say, imagine waking up every morning and going to your mirror and no, not saying how great you are, saying, I'm a fake, I'm a bluff. It's only a matter of time till at the office they get to know that, that I can't really do this. And you know they don't know that I cry when I get home, but I'm really a waster, I'm really shit. <laughs> And go out in the day and have a nice day. <laughs> you know, this is the power of your suggestion. And we know now yeah, through science that it will actually trigger a part in your brain. It has a name. I'm not going to say any brain names, but it will trigger an action where you will have chemicals released and you will have a, a feeling from it, a feeling, an emotion. So you will probably be bad. But it does work the other way around. Now, with autogenic training, what you have there is you are told, first of all, externally, so as you can learn to say it internally, uh, and you will say, my left arm is heavy. My left arm is heavy. And you will concentrate on your left arm. And after a while, you think, well, that does feel heavy. <laughs> and the same through all of your limbs. And then you will control the blood flow, uh, flow, the circulation, by saying, my left foot is warm. And going through everything. Now, the strange thing is, after a while of doing that, of laying there, um, you do start to feel that. You do start to get heavy. And then at the end of it, when you are coming to it, you can feel a fresh breeze on your, on your face, and you realize that your shoulders 
that you've had tens tensed up without knowing it. I mean, if anyone's watching this now, I mean, just, just do this. And maybe some of you have been sitting like this. Well, you, I mean, you shouldn't be watching me if you're sitting like this. You should be getting on with your work. <laughs> but we'll have that, those kind of feelings. And I realized that through listening to this lady's voice, as I say, at the end, autogenic training, you won't have to listen to it. But we have programs which can stimulate and help you do this. It affects how you feel. Now, there, getting into that, I realized that there were all kinds of other sounds and vibrations that, that can help you. Now, this thing of vibrations uh, uh, as well. Now, looking into the esoteric, and we have a word like cosmic. I would switch off uh, uh, cosmic. But when you start getting into vibrations and how everything vibrates and how the earth vibrates, there's something called Schumann's frequency that tells you where the earth vibrates, round about 10 hertz. A hertz is a cycle per second. And see that with our resting state is almost the same. Coincidence? Could be. But you have to have a, an open mind. And then you realize that um, with an uh, electrocardiograph, uh, you can measure impulses. And when you're talking about the brain with an EEC, you measure the brain. And when you are relaxed, you will have slower impulses like alpha waves. And when you are stressed, you will have fast ones. Now, there is something called entrainment. And what entrainment is, is taking one signal to influence another one and to synchronize it. This is found in, in nature. You can see this with pendulums that will end up swinging together. There are also stories of ladies living together and their menstrual cycles coming in to, to synchronize. So there's various things that can start this entrainment. And what um, these various signals do, they can be called binaural beats, isochronic tones, whatever. These are external signals and Sonic Sonic has a number of them. And what they would do is they would give a rhythm. Now rhythm is a, a total other thing where I can speak for hours because it's very, very important because that is the thing that we'll tap our feet to and we'll, we will get in sync uh, with it. But if we keep it in this short interview, just to the brain waves, we are going to be listening to an impulse and our waves will synchronize to it. And we'll actually feel it and it works whether you believe it or not. It's like with stroboscopic light, it's exactly the same thing. It's an impulse coming from outside uh, and if it gets to a certain frequency, these are kind of the resonant frequencies, what they're called, similar to, to something that's happening in people that are very uh, sensitive to that. It can cause some horrible things in their, in their brain, it can make them feel sick. It can even uh, let, give them fits. So this thing of external signals, steering internal signals and synchronizing them is also rather well documented. So, you know, I would say science-based. So that's what got me onto, onto this trip. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if this exists, why hasn't somebody done it before? Why do I keep getting pills? And why am I taking so many tablets? And when I realized that the tablet that I am taking for my blood pressure or for my blood fat, uh, they cost a fortune, but my insurance paid for them. So there's something going on there financially with the pharmaceutical companies. And also if I see, does it work better than Sonic Tonic? Well, actually I learned that the stuff I'm taking to uh, get my cholesterol down as well, only works for one in every so many people. I, don't, I think the number's 30 or 50 or 100, whatever it is, it's not everyone. So it doesn't work for the, the 29 people around me, we're taking it for nothing. We're giving 29 times money to some corporation. That's what they don't tell us. Now, before we get onto any uh, theories like, like that, one of my theories is that, that with things like this, which are natural, that people are, have just forgotten it. You know, I, I realize you've got me on my favorite subject here so I can talk for hours, but please let me say one last thing about sleep because stress can come not just from external problems, it will come from lack of sleep or the sleep that is disturbed 
because of the thinking that I spoke about, the circular thinking that you think, all right, I do want to think about these eventualities, but not now, I'd like to sleep now. Yeah. Ways of getting to sleep. You know, I came to London and started, uh, I, I spoke to some event about sleep, about melatonin and how certain sounds can generate that. And that was a huge thing. I got 12 radio interviews because people were very interested. So sleep as the base, basis of some depression is very interesting. But the stress comes, comes before that. But the thing is with sleep, when you read, I mean, if anybody has a sleep problem, I mean, you don't have to buy Sonic Sonic. I really am not selling anything. In fact, I, the first thing, uh, I, I made it totally free, so I'm giving it away. But uh, the, what I learned was that pink noise which are white noise is noise where you have all of the frequencies and pink noises just balanced a little bit to be more like nature but this is the, na the natural sounds of like the wind rustling through the through the trees and a chinese university did uh, a study on that and had an 80 percent report of people in the study saying that they slept better and this is you know, the cost of making that for me is zero. Okay, I mean, I sell it for, for, for money, but it is zero. And if somebody wanted to do something like that or to put on a fan in their room or, or something, there's a lot of things that people can do, which even if we're talking about sleep, they are still stress related and it all comes into the same things, mental awareness. We need to develop mental hygiene. And I suppose that's a good last word of this bit. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your knowledge and the tips and everything that you have been saying. Actually, there are more and more initiatives, apps, uh, music institutions also that are trying to raise awareness of mental health. But even though, even though in Europe and all over the world, there are more initiatives, uh, music workers in general, either they are not aware of the possible occupational health risks, or they are not taking them seriously, or they are afraid to speak out about mental health. Um, what do you think? How can we overcome the stigma uh, in talking openly about mental health? This is a very common question, and it, again, it is a, a question of, of, of attitude and social habits uh, that have to change. I know that when I started first on Sonic Sonic, you know, my company here, my junior partner said, oh, you know, do you really want to say that? You know, I said, why? He said, well, you know, you're supposed to be <laughs> our founder and our boss. They're going to think you're weak. I think, well, I'm not weak. <laughs> you know, and it, it is not a sign of weakness. It's the thing. And it's not a sign of, of being a weak person. It's usually... People, I mean, I'm not an alpha animal, but I'm not a, a wallflower either. And, you know, you have to have a certain amount of push and confidence and, and, and a bit of aura about you to, to be successful and also to get people to work for you and to follow your common goal. But this attitude of the man in the street, we can call him, um, that it's something, a sign of weakness, is, is rubbish or a sign of, of being stupid. I mean, some of the, <laughs> the, the most... Uh, intelligent people you'll find, find them in a mental hospital uh, and it, see, it seems to really have something to do with intelligence because it's the thinking but this attitude must change you know we have had years of people working much too much on uh, really offering their whole life to their job and wanting to be something in the eyes of somebody else and not enjoying their lives you know it's like going on the journey from birth to death and not bothering to look out the window, just running as fast as you can. Uh, but now work-life balance has come. And, uh, you know, I wish I'd discovered that expression a little bit earlier because I was, uh, or I am successful in my work, but I'm not so successful in life in general. I mean, if we look at things, I mean, okay, I have a son, but I had a bad marriage behind me. I've had all sorts of other health problems, which uh, come back to the work. Uh, so we used to wear our mental health problems like a badge. And that was a problem. We called it burnout. 
And burnout was called, oh, he's burned out, he's in, he's in the clinic. You know, burned out, he's had a nervous breakdown. You know, he's, he's a, a poor guy, he's sick. And if you have a broken leg, you will get the sympathy and, oh, you'll be helped to your seat and everything. But if you come along and, and you're depressed, you know, people would usually, oh, you know, pull yourself together, you know, <laughs> and you can't pull yourself together. And I think that this understanding uh, is really changing. And it is important that it does change, that we get this understanding uh, for people that have these problems and realize that it is, in a lot of cases, a chemical imbalance, basically. Um, it's things coming into your blood which are giving you stress. You know, you, you have the cortisol running around you, your heart is beating, you're ready to go and put out a fire, but there is no fire. And you're asking yourself, Who's, who turned that tap on? You know, and if somebody's close to you and saying, pull yourself together, that's not going to help in any way. So, what do we need? We need an understanding. We need more people to speak about it. And this is what I do at every opportunity, which gets on people's nerves because I know. <laughs> when people are close to me and that they can hear the trigger words and then, oh, there's John, he's off. <laughs> and then I go off on my, on my talk. But I am a crusader. You know, I, I feel drawn to people who have problems. So when they tell me them, it wakes the empathy in me. And it, it is a kind of a love. It's a, it's, a, it's a warm feeling for people and I want to help them. Um, but I'm not altruistic. You know, I thought this was Sonic Tonic. I still want to sell it at the end of the day. Uh, but the helping is the good thing instead of the money you get a wonderful feeling by doing something good so i think the combination of both things but it must start with a, an awareness that this is out there big time and that people that are suffering from it don't be ashamed i mean really do not be ashamed talk about it and you'll be surprised how things have changed well thank you i mean i couldn't say it like I couldn't find a better uh, ending for this conversation. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Um, My pleasure. This moment was just wanted to be a, a moment of exchange and, and just a moment to help raise awareness, as you said, uh, on mental health. Um, it is important to speak about it. And even though the music industry will uh, probably most likely remain a, a volatile and competitive place, um, Mm. We can all commit to make it a more accepting and safer place, but just like raising awareness and, and, and do our part. You're right. I mean, musicians have always suffered. I mean, uh, artists in general uh, have to suffer to get inspiration. But the kind of suffering that's going on these days is not that what we're talking about. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have any poetry in it. It is just something totally unnecessary. And there, that is the reason why help is needed. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, John. And uh, well, we'll see you soon. And we hope this conversation actually helped someone out there. I hope so too. All right. Thank you for asking me. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Bye. To conclude today's talk, um, let us mention that even though the music community may be more likely to experience anxiety, depression, Mental health problems can actually affect anyone at any time. More and more companies and institutions in Europe and all over the world are launching initiatives and studies which are meant to look at the well being of artists and of music creators. As one of these initiatives, uh, we would like to mention the Call for Tender, which was launched last year for a study on the health and well being for music creators. Uh, this initiative was launched. Uh, within the context of the preparatory action Music Moves Europe, boosting European music diversity and talent. Although the study is still at an early stage, it will hopefully foster the exchange of best practices and information for a more sustainable approach in the music field. So what's left? Well, let's continue educating ourselves talking more openly about mental health and continue promoting initiatives and existing support networks. It doesn't have to take a lot to create a lasting change. Well, thanks again for listening and hopefully see you soon at one of the Exa Next cultural events.